Well, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks so much for coming out for uh, Mark Lynch's talk. Uh, and Mark will not be using PowerPoint slides, believe it or not, so I have to read you the title. You will be just gazing at the map of the Middle East. There will be a map quiz uh, at the end of the end of the session. So look look closely, look carefully. Um, the, the not too many rivers. Um, so uh, Mark is, uh, as I'm sure you all know, uh, is professor of political science and international affairs uh, and also director of the project on Middle East political science or POMEPS at George Washington University. And uh, I think it's really fitting for uh, Mark to be here today. The, the, the title of his talk, by the way, is Battle Scars, the Middle East after the Arab Uprisings. And it was, it was occurring to me today, it's, it's kind of ideal and fitting in a lot of ways for Mark to, to be here in the sense that he and I have both been looking at a lot of the same kind of questions for the past couple of decades, questions of authoritarian regimes, the conditions that uh, facilitate them being challenged, when they collapse, when they endure. Uh, but I've been doing this in Southeast Asia, and Mark's been doing this in the Middle East, and so today is actually probably the, the, t the most we've gotten to spend time together. We've actually been pretty parallel. So the really the point of WCED, the Wiser Center for Emerging Democracies, is that we're gonna bring people together. It's really a global center, people working on these themes from all around the world. So we're really happy to have a talk on the Middle East, uh, and without further ado, we'll have our low-tech, non-PowerPoint presentation from, uh, from Mark Lynch. So thanks for coming, thanks Mark. <laughs> thanks, Dan. And thanks all for, for coming out. Um, I, we, we were just uh, talking with some of the graduate students um, and postdocs um, about all of this stuff, and they came out looking like they had been they were at a funeral. Um, so I can't I can't promise an uplifting talk because this is still the Middle East. But I'm delighted to have the chance to to talk. I'm going to talk, uh, God willing, for about 30 35 minutes or so, and then leave as much time as possible for uh, you guys to ask questions. And because uh, there's so much happening in the Middle East, I'm not going to try and give you a uh, blow by blow, play by play of everything that's happening. Instead, I want to kind of give more of like an overview of some, I think, big, you know, kind of big questions, big picture things that I've been thinking about and that inform the book that, uh, that I'm working on that, uh, that Dan mentioned. The, um, title, the working title of the book is, uh, is Battle Scars, uh, Middle East After the Uprisings. Um, and uh, I think that the, this is going to be the third book that I've written about this you kind know, of general theme. Um, and you know, it's, if you look at them, they kind of give a trajectory not dissimilar from the uprisings themselves. So the first one uh, was the Arab Uprising. It came out in 2012. It was written in the heat of the moment at a time when you know, everyone was extremely enthusiastic about the uprisings. At that point, it looked like this was a wave, kind of uh, a secular trend towards uh, you know, a fundamentally transformed region. And um, one of the things about that book is it was a very it was a very easy book to write because you, as you're excited and you know everything's going really well and um, I wrote it very quickly um, and I was very much caught up in the enthusiasm of the moment like everyone else was, but the end of the book was actually fairly um, uh, kind of it was giving a real warning basically saying that every other time in the region's history that they've had a in, you know in the 20th century history where there's been this moment of popular enthusiasm and wave of uprisings. The outcome has been the reassertion of state power in much more violent and authoritarian ways. And so each round, going back over a century, of popular mobilization, no matter what the initial success, seemed to end up in fiercer, worse states. So I said, look, be optimistic, be enthusiastic. I think things are different this time, but you, gotta, you, you wanna be cautious about this. So then the next book, uh, The New Arab Wars, was basically about how you know, everything went, in fact, wrong. Um, and looking at the ways in which the failures of, of individual uprisings uh, were very much rooted in what I saw as a system-wide, a region-wide um, process by which uprisings didn't simply fail. They didn't simply you know, fail on their own. For the most part, their failure was part of concerted regional interventionism designed to make them fail. So there wasn't just a military coup in Egypt. This was a coup sponsored by and supported by the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and the other Gulf states as a way of preventing Egypt from becoming more democratic and for their, from their point of view, above all, not being ruled by a Qatar-friendly Muslim brother. Um, around the region, uh, Bahrain's uh, uprising didn't just fail. Uh, Saudi Arabia sent in troops to help make sure that it failed. Um, and in Libya, in Saudi Arabia, in Yemen, 
external interventions played a decisive role in pushing them from transition into civil war and into failure. So the New Arab Wars was very much about the ways in which at a regional level the, the forces worked, uh, counter-revolution excuse me, counter-revolutionary forces worked to try and make sure that there would not be successful democratic transitions around. And so this was a very depressing book. This was hard to write because it was full of trauma and war and horror and failure. And it was actually extraordinarily depressing to have to go back and immerse myself so deeply um, in, in Syria and in Libya and Yemen and all those cases. But that one actually ended up on what I consider to be a hopeful note which was to say that writing at that time, that book came out in 2016, and at that time, the general sense was the Arab uprisings were over, everything was back to the bad old normal, the counter-revolution had succeeded, and that now we should think about Middle Eastern politics, and especially Arab politics, pretty much the same way we thought about them before the Arab uprisings. You know, think about it in terms of uh, the, you know, the efforts to contain Iran, the impossibility of democracy, that basically things had gone back to the way they were. And what I said at the, at the last chapter of New Arab Wars was, this is completely wrong. In fact, the region has changed in fundamental ways, and there's almost certainly going to be renewed protests, renewed challenges to systems that were fundamental failures in terms of governance, in terms of delivery of decent lives to their citizens, but also which had had to crank up the repression or burn through resources in the, in the name of co-optation in order to restabilize. And the basic takeaway from the final chapter there was there's not a single country in the region which is more stable, has better governance, or is you know, in, a, in a better place than they were in 2010, the eve of the uprisings. And so, you know, so for me, that's hopeful. For them, not so hopeful. Um, but for me, that was hopeful. I mean, for the regimes, it's not so hopeful, right? Because they don't want to see protests to change or democracy or that sort of thing. They want to have things continue as they are. And my point was that's not going to happen. That, in fact, what we're likely to see is ongoing instability, protest, and uh, you know, kind of moves in a number of uh, probably unpredictable directions in ways that um, I am now exploring in this third book. Um, so the Battle Scars book is supposed to try and grapple with some, I think, deeper theoretical issues um, raised by the first two about the question of, of change and the question of the possibility of change, the reality of change, and how we even think about what change is at the political level. And to try and really start thinking through which of these changes that, we, that we've seen over the last 10 years are likely to prove significant over the long run, which of them are likely to be transient, which of them are likely to be enduring, and how they relate to each other. Um, and what I'm going to do for about half hour here is I want to kind of walk through some of the things that I would observe about how these, what has changed, what has not changed at starting at the international global level and then working my way down through regional politics, uh, kind of the state level domestic politics, and, um, and then at, at kind of level of individuals and, um, and, and society. Um, for those of you uh, who, are, who take your IR classes or work in international relations, you'll be very familiar with this wonderful levels of analysis approach, which has been widely debunked and everyone has abandoned it, which is why, of course, it's right and uh, everyone should use it. Um, anyway, just kidding. Um, it was useful for me to organize my thoughts on what is an extremely complex and difficult set of issues. Uh, and I, I tried a number of different ways to think this through. Levels of analysis worked for me. Uh, hopefully, it'll work for you. So let me start uh, at the global level. Um, and so I think one of the fundamental things, for me at least, to understand about the Arab uprisings of 2011 is that fundamentally, um, in a very real and very direct way, these were a direct challenge to the American-led Middle East. That this was, they were aimed very much at the order that the United States helped put in place and had actively underwritten and directed uh, since, uh, if you want to be charitable, say 1991, uh, after the kind of the move towards unipolarity and the establishment of what some might call an American imperium over the Middle East, where the United States was allied with almost every region in the Middle East, maintained large-scale military basing across a significant portion of those countries, and played an active role in working with and supporting the regimes in almost every one of those countries. If you look at the pattern of where the Arab uprisings broke out, uh, they didn't only 
happen in American allies. Remember Bashar al-Assad, originally it was like, I have nothing to worry about because I'm not an American ally, and these are only going after American allies. That's not entirely true. Uh, obviously, um, Gaddafi and Bashar al-Assad both had their own uprisings. Um, but it is the case that the push for change was, by definition, a push to change an American-led regional order. The, the Egypt, Tunisia, Bahrain, uh, even Yemen, these are American allies. And to the extent that you see fundamental change in those regimes, this change is going to, by definition, disrupt the, uh, the American-led regional order. And for the Obama administration, this was a real problem because the Obama administration was, in very real ways, more than I think most people appreciate, genuinely believed that the uprisings were a positive thing. If you go back and you read Obama's speech at the State Department um, in May of, of 2011, I think this really articulated his very, very deep belief that this was the wave of the future. This was what was going to happen. You know, the, that the, with this rising generation demanding change, democracy was inevitable, and it was important for the United States to get out in front of that and to work with it and to try and nurture that change. You remember he compared the Arab Spring to the Civil Rights Movement. He talked about the arc of history bending in a, whatever, the good direction um, and all that stuff. So he genuinely, I think, believed that, but at the same time, he, had, he was forced to recognize that this posed a fundamental challenge to the American-led regional order. And this was well understood by many of the people, if not most of the people, participating in those protests. They were under no illusions about the fact that Hosni Mubarak, in a very real way, continued to rule Egypt for 30 years because the United States supported him. They did not need to be told that. They understood it deeply. And when they were challenging Mubarak, they were challenging the United States as well. Now, generally speaking, what I would say is that looking at the United States and its role over the course of the Middle East, uh, over its role in the Middle East since the uprisings, there's a couple of things which I think people point to and they look at as they see it as extremely significant in terms of altering the American role in the region. So, for example, they look at uh, the U.S. withdrawal from Iraq in 2010. They look at the red line uh, debacle uh, where the United States said it was going to bomb Syria and then the last minute decided not to bomb Syria. Um, they might look at um, you know, various things that the Trump administration has done. And I think there's, a, there's a, the real tendency to want to isolate out these specific things as a moment when the trajectory went all wrong. Things would have been okay if, if, if Obama had not abandoned Mubarak. Everything would have been fine. If the United States had not pulled out of Iraq, if we had bombed Syria. These, I think, are fundamentally wrong, all of them. Every single one of them is wrong. Whether I like it or I opposed it, it doesn't matter. Because I think there is a fundamental structural change, which is that the United States is no longer in a position of global or regional unipolarity. Uh, the United States is no longer has either the will or the capability to sustain a US-led regional order in the Middle East. And this has been building, depending on how you'd like to count, I would say uh, probably since 2003 and the invasion of Iraq, certainly since the financial crisis of 2008, um, and is basically a secular trend of diminishing US centrality in world politics. Um, and it would be very nice and easy for some people to blame this on Barack Obama. It would be very easy for some other people to blame this on Donald Trump. I think it's a structural trend. The U.S. is simply no longer capable of sustaining a strategy of unipolarity because it is not a unipolar power. It no longer has the military dominance, the economic capabilities, or the institutional place to, uh, to make that happen. And so when I think of the things that are fundamentally changing about the Middle East, I think that the shift from a unipolar system in which all roads led through Washington to what is essentially a multipolar system in which there are multiple great power um, contenders for regional influence is a fundamental and structural one, which is not going to be reversed by the next president or the president after that. Um, it is a reality that Russia and China, at the least, um, are now uh, great power competitors, not peers, but great power competitors in a way that did not exist from 1990 to 2010 when the US was the unchallenged hegemon of the Middle East. And I think that this actually has a lot of structural effects um, beyond the obvious. Um, I think that it has fundamentally changed the nature of US alliances with its regional allies. Um, and it helps to explain a lot of the, uh, shall we say, 
tense relationships that we've seen between the United States and those allies, um, where you see you know real competition over things like the Iran nuclear the Iran nuclear deal or the um, or the role in the peace process or things like that. But in general, you've seen a real decline of U.S. power and leverage in its intra alliance bargaining with with its uh, with its allies. Basically, the allies have choices now. And they know it. And so, if Turkey doesn't like the, uh, the if it doesn't like what the U.S. is offering on F-35s, it can go get uh, S-400 uh, 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 anti-aircraft defenses from Russia, and the United States will huff and puff and then do nothing, because the U.S. is not in a position anymore to dictate um, unilaterally the terms of its intra-alliance politics. Um, and I think that this applies to the U.S. relations with Israel, U.S. relations with Saudi Arabia, the U.S. relations with, um, with, with everyone. All roads no longer lead through Washington. Now, you say, who are these great power competitors? Um, I think that um, you know, the, most people look at Russia, understandably. Uh, you know, Russia did something in Syria which people didn't think could be done. It intervened militarily, uh, and it won decisively in Syria at relatively low cost to itself. And um, at that established, for better or for worse, uh, it's a, a place in the region where it became viewed as a valued partner, as a valued provider of military assistance, as someone who could, when it chose to do so, meaningfully and significantly disrupt U.S. policy in the region. So you've seen Russia getting involved everywhere from Libya to Yemen, even absolute American clients, utterly dependent U.S. clients like King Abdullah of Jordan now goes on trips to Moscow uh, to meet with Putin because there's a recognition of Russia's ability to not rule or, or dominate the region, but to disrupt American plans for the region. And it's been very effective at that. I tend to think that over the long term, though, Russia is uh, not a significant contender uh, for uh, long term peer competition with the United States. It's a fairly um, a, a one dimensional power. It can sell arms and it can intervene militarily. It doesn't really have anything else that most Arab states want. Um, the, its weapon systems aren't all that great. Its, uh, its economy is too cyclical with the Arab countries. They all sell oil. And so when when Arab states need economic assistance, well, so does Russia. And when Russia's wealthy, so are the Arab states. So it's cyclical, it doesn't really help them, it doesn't give them access to international institutions, all kinds of other things. I think Russia is largely a declining power playing uh, a weak hand extremely well um, in, in realpolitik terms. Whereas China is actively and fundamentally rewiring uh, the, the Middle East as part of its expansion of its global interests, the, the Belt and Road Initiative, um, the large scale construction of ports, infrastructure projects, um, creating all kinds of new relationships um, with Iran, with Saudi Arabia, the Gulf. I mean, if people aren't really paying attention, you would be shocked at the diversity and the magnitude of the deals that have been struck between China, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Iran, UAE, and Qatar over the last three years. Uh, the, the strategic relationships among them are evolving in fundamental ways that largely get ignored, um, but I think are likely to be more fundamental for reshaping the region than what we're seeing with Russia. In both cases, this leads to uh, diminution of the American role. Again, it's not that we've, the United States is no longer uh, in a dominant position in the region, it is, but it's no longer an unchallenged one, and there are clear alternatives for other states, and I think that has syst systematic effects across the region. One of the things, I'll say two things about, about China very quickly. Um, one is that it has very little investment in the issues which typically consume America. Um, it couldn't care less about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It doesn't really care about Syria because Syria isn't in the geographic stretch that it wants. Its, its primary interests are twofold. Energy, it's extremely dependent on oil uh, from the Gulf, and not just China, but the entire Southeast Asian and, and Asian uh, economic system, um, extremely dependent on oil, and so it has a fundamental interest in keeping that oil flowing. So the United States might like to go to war with Iran, China does not. China wants to keep that energy flowing, and I think that that's something which is fundamental. And then secondly, um, it wants to make sure that it has a, um, a safe and secure 
um, passage into Africa and all of its investments there. It sees the Middle East in really classic geopolitical terms, like back to the you know 19th century, right? It's like they it, it's imp it's important because of its location for China, and so Syria's up there, you know, going up into Europe. They don't care. What they care about is the Gulf. They care about the the Horn of Africa. They care about safe passage into North Africa, which gets them access down into Sub-Saharan Africa, and so their priorities are going to be different than ours. And at some points, those will align, and at other points, they will not. I thought it was absolutely fascinating uh, speaking with, uh, well, anyway, um, there your video, this is on video, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> so it's absolutely fascinating after the, uh, the attacks on some of the shipping in the Gulf, um, which, were, uh, which were blamed correctly on Iran. Um, and there was a talk of creating a maritime, you know, this joint maritime um, uh, force to police the Gulf. And one of the big ideas about this was that China would be invited to join it. And this makes perfect sense, right? Multilateral cooperation uh, on a common public good of uh, make, making sure that uh, the energy from the Gulf is protected and flows freely, except for the fact that keeping China from having a military presence in the Gulf has been one of the top American strategic priorities for 50 years thrown out the window without a second thought because we are no longer capable of doing this on our own. China has a tremendous interest in doing so. And um, I remember it was only like five years ago or something like that when uh, I would go around shocking people in Washington saying that uh, I would be shocked if within 10 years there weren't uh, Chinese naval bases in the Gulf. And they would say, no, that could never happen. It's an American lake and everything. And now if I say that, people don't even flinch. They simply say, well, of course, they have energy interests there. They want to protect them. This is a fundamental change to me, which has largely gone unremarked. Um, I mean, in some quarters it gets remarked, but it, I think at the popular level, it really doesn't get discussed very much. Okay, so I know you're all thinking, we came here to hear about the Middle East, and all he's doing is talking about the great powers, but I think it's important for, for framing these changes, which really are structural, I think, and really do change the way the Middle East is going to be run um, and the way it's going to evolve over the next few years. Let me go down to regional politics. So one of the most, oh, I have to have a laser pointer because um, usually I like to like play with cats with it, which is like really fun. But I just wanted to have this to point because I never get a laser pointer, so this is cool. Okay, so traditionally speaking, um, when you talk about Middle East regional order, there is a normal way that the region is structured. This is the way the United States structured it after 1991, and it's what the U.S. Um, basically tried to keep in place uh, for quite some time. The basic idea is that the U.S. Run, well, you, look at oh, Tunisia's there. That's good. Poor Morocco. Um, you don't you don't get Morocco. But the basic idea is that the United States and its imperium is essentially one which is clustered around uh, two core alliances. Uh, alliance with Israel, alliance with Saudi Arabia and the Gulf, and that essentially the purpose and the functioning of the post-1991 regional order was to make sure that the U.S. could protect the oil from the Gulf, uh, contain Iranian power, and keep Israel secure, and it did so by helping to broker and sustain peace between Israel and Egypt, Israel and Jordan, supervising the peace process uh, between Israel and the Palestinians. Now, it's, it's extremely important to know, everyone says that this has been a failure because it hasn't brought about peace. And it's true, it is a failure because it hasn't brought about peace. But it's been extremely successful at serving as a vehicle for making it possible for the U.S. to be closely allied with both Israel and Saudi Arabia, which are technically at war with each other and, um, and supposedly don't like each other. Having a peace process means that Arab states can stay in the same alliance structure as Israel because Israel is moving towards a future in which there will be peace with the Palestinians. This was the core of the Saudi peace plan of, of 2002 and has been a central part of the American uh, strategy for the region. Um, the typical balance of power was one in which Egypt is a great power and it provides for uh, uh, Israeli security. It keeps everything kind of moving along you know, steadily there. It's been a tremendous success since 1979 or since 1981, depending on how you want to count. An enormously successful alliance, which people don't even think about how important it is because we just take it for granted now. Um, but this basically, the, uh, the peace treaty with, with Egypt is what keeps Israel secure. It allows it to do most of the other things that it does towards the Palestinians and everybody else. Um, and then the, uh, the, the Gulf Cooperation Council, uh, the six states of the Gulf, were brought together into an anti-Iranian uh, coalition to be a, a, single, a single 
point of call for U.S. alliance politics in maintaining the containment of Iran. Um, and then uh, throughout the, you know, th through the 1990s to the 2003, um, the idea that you would maintain dual containment of Iraq and Iran, which of course can't really be done with the power of the Gulf. So that becomes both the necessitation and the justification for the construction of a very large number of American military bases all through these small states in the Gulf, um, which do the, f which basically have the dual function of keeping the United States essential for the security of the Gulf and keeping all other great powers out, keeping Iran contained. Invasion of Iraq in 2003 kind of throws all of this out of whack, of course, because now once Iraq is out of the picture, now the United States has to directly occupy Iraq, gets bogged down in that extraordinarily draining war, unleashing sectarianism, increasing Iranian power, and basically making it extremely difficult for the US to focus on anything else for a period of about 10 years. But still, from 1991 until 2011, this is basically the, the region. That's the, you know, it's basically an alliance between Israel and Saudi Arabia, underwritten by the United States to contain Iran and uh, deal with whatever is going to happen in Iraq, right? So that's the basic structure of the region from 1991 to 2010. If you look, oh, and, and it was extraordinarily successful. At, at maintaining America, America's role in the region and accomplishing the goals the U.S. set out, Israeli security, keeping the oil flowing, and maintaining its own primacy in the region. Everyone always talks about U.S. foreign policy as a failure, in the Middle East as a failure, but on its own terms, it was extremely successful. Um, the states that were not part of the American-led alliance system, there were not very many of them. Well, Iran, of course, is being contained and all that other stuff. Libya, um, at a certain point decides to cash in its alleged nuclear and chemical weapons programs so it can get in and uh, it join, you know, it basically tries to become an American ally and succeeds in 2003. Syria spends the entire decade of the 1990s negotiating with Israel as its price of admission to get into the U.S.-led alliance system, which ultimately fails. But the point is that there was a single alliance and it was, that's the way the, the, the system was wired. Let's look at the region now. Who are the great powers in the Middle East today? Egypt is a basket case. Um, it can barely contain its own security, has very little influence anywhere outside its own immediate neighborhood. Um, at most, it's able to work with Israel in policing Gaza and maintains a little bit of a role there. But as a regional player, Egypt is now largely irrelevant. It's a taker, not a maker of regional policy. It's financially dependent on Saudi Arabia and the UAE. It is barely keeps itself solvent. And anybody who's following the news right now knows that it is also extremely uh, unstable domestically. Libya used to be a player, is now a failed state. Um, and uh, so again, a complete basket case, uh, bereft by civil war, multiple competing governments. It's one of the major uh, conduits of the flow of weapons, guns, drugs, and refugees from every place in Point South and, and, and also into Egypt and up into Gaza. Um, so Libya, totally off the uh, thing. Tunisia, yay Tunisia. Okay, everyone loves Tunisia, I love Tunisia. Luckily it's way over there, it doesn't matter. Um, no, seriously, I mean, uh, no, I'm serious. Uh, Rasha Ghadushi, the, the, the leader of uh, uh, Nehda, the main Islamist party in Tunisia, I once asked him, like everybody asked him, how did you succeed and everybody else failed? And he said, it's because nobody cares about us. We're blessed by not having oil, being far away from Israel, so everyone left us alone to uh, navigate our own transition. It's, I thought it was an interesting answer. Um, but then, okay, so Egypt, no longer a great power. Libya, not a great power. Syria used to be a great power, basket case, barely, you know, civil war, producer of refugees, um, unable to control its own territory, its own people. Three of the major powers of the traditional Middle East are absolute basket cases. They are takers, not makers of policy, and that is gone. Iraq is sort of, sort of kind of stabilized on a good day. It's not totally consumed by civil war. It is not a player in regional politics. It's begun to be a little bit of a bridge as it, out of desperation between Iran and the Gulf. You see Saudi Arabia courting it. You see Iran continuing to dominate its politics. But again, Iraq is a taker, not a maker of regional policy. Who are the great powers of the Middle East? Turkey, certainly, non-Arab state. Iran, certainly, non-Arab state. Israel, certainly, non-Arab state. Okay, where are the Arab great powers? Here's where things get really interesting in terms of the regional balance of power. So Saudi Arabia, of course, continues to be a regional great power. Um, it's gone through um, 
I would say a period of overstretch and a few bad decisions and uh, things like that, but it's definitely a regional power. Qatar and the UAE are regional great powers. And this is actually a fascinating development um, because you know, they're tiny countries and by traditional realist understandings of power, they shouldn't count, right? You can, you can fit like, you know, you probably fit the population of Qatar in this room, right? Um, UAE, you know, the, you know, the seven Emirates, whatever. They're tiny. They used to be largely subordinate to Saudi foreign policy. You wouldn't consider them to be great powers, but they are. And the reason they are is that even by realist standards, they are more capable of projecting power in the region than any of the traditional great powers. Both Qatar and the UAE have extremely well-equipped, well-trained professional militaries, uh, special forces, air forces, which have now gained tremendous experience in fighting wars in Libya and in Yemen. And they are actually capable, to project, capable of projecting power in ways that certainly Egypt can't, Syria can't, Iraq can't, none of these countries. Even when it wasn't a basket case, Egypt couldn't project, couldn't project power. Whereas the UAE and, Saudi and uh, Qatar can project power, military hard power. They also have enormous advantages in soft power. Uh, they both run major media enterprises. Sa UAE is consistently voted in surveys funded by the UAE to be the most popular uh, place to live in the Middle East and the most admired place in the Middle East. Um, and even if those are UAE funded surveys, there's some reality to it. People want to live in a place that is rich, stable, um, relative, you know, it's like got a decent quality of life. And, and Qatar um, is, it, through its ability to uh, have TV stations like Al Jazeera, its mobilization of activist networks and Islamist networks, is able to project influence broadly across the Middle East. So when you start talking about the Middle East and its balance of power now, it's a multi. In Qatar. In Qatar, right here, yeah. The, the, lar la the largest U.S. military base. That I, I, I swear to God, I'm going to talk about this in a second. But I swear to God, when uh, when when Donald Trump spoke out in favor of the boycott, the blockade of Qatar, I'm 100% sure that he didn't know there was a military. The U.S. had a military <laughs> base there. 100% sure. So anyway, I'm going to get to that right now. Actually, the logic of power politics in the Middle East has fundamentally changed. Right. So now. Qatar and the UAE are engaged in a region-wide battle for power and influence. The UAE and Saudi Arabia have been closely aligned on this, but not perfectly aligned. So in general, what you've seen is multiple overlapping cleavages in the region, which have led to profound destabilization across the region. The basic, po the basic approach to the Arab uprisings of 2011 and what followed by these states it has basically been, if an uprising hits one of our friends, we will do whatever is possible to save our friend. And so they sent, Saudi Arabia sends the military into Bahrain. They sent huge amounts of money to, uh, to poor Gulf states like Kuwait and Oman, Jordan, Morocco. Um, they, uh, they underwrite and fund the military coup in Egypt to bring Egypt back into the fold. So basically, if they're our friends, we save them. If they're not our friends, then we take advantage of instability to wage proxy wars on their territory. So in Libya, Qatar and the UAE have poured huge amounts of money. So is Turkey, actually. Uh, money, guns into local proxies on the ground, and that's what keeps that civil war going. Yemen has been torn apart by the civil war uh, and the direct Saudi intervention into that civil war. Syria, I think, is a prime victim of the competition between Qatar, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Iran. Turns into, into a proxy war that's been, been incredibly destructive and destabilized. But the point of all this is that, that these wars, in a sense, have gone the duration, the magnitude, and the horrors that they have because it has served the interests of, or the perceived interests of, of these Gulf countries to fight their proxy wars there. Influence and power uh, are, in a sense, measured by your success on these battlefields. Almost no costs are paid by those home countries. I mean, what, is, what does UAE or Qatar care if Syrian refugees are pouring out by the millions into Turkey, into Lebanon, into Jordan? What do they care? They, they don't pay any cost. Intervention is cheap. The rewards are high from their point of view. The costs are extremely low. And they've done so consistently in an uncoordinated competitive way. So it's not like they're all backing the Syrian opposition against Assad. They're all backing their own factions. 
which means that they often end up competing with each other within the opposition as much as they do fighting against Assad, which helps to go a long way to explaining why the Syrian insurgency turned into such a failure and became radicalized uh, and turned into the jihadist insurgency that it became. So the traditional structure of the Middle East, and you guys are going to go crazy when I say this, but I'm telling you I'm, I'm, telling you I'm right, that Donald Trump has been trying to restore the traditional structure in the Middle East. He wants to organize the region around an alliance between Israel and Saudi Arabia to contain Iran. That is what he is trying to do. It is not just a normal, it, it's not just like a normal grand strategy. It has been our grand strategy for a very long time. The reason that he's failing at it is because everything else has changed. And the most emblematic part of that is, is what you were referring to which was in 2017, after Trump's visit to Saudi Arabia, uh, the UAE and Saudi Arabia announced the blockade of Qatar and the attempt to uh, basically they stopped the functioning of the GCC and they turned this into one of the principal lines of conflict in the region. Now, Qatar is vulnerable to blockade because it's a peninsula. Um, and so you can actually, you know, cut off that little, uh, Wait, where's my pointer? There. You can actually cut off the, the border there, and you could police the airspace, and you could actually starve them out, except for the fact that this is the single richest country per, in per capita GDP in the country. And so I used to joke, when the blockade broke out, and people were saying, we're going to get milk, and I made a joke. I said, Qatar could buy first class airplane tickets for 10,000 cows and fly them in and they wouldn't even notice the expense. And you know what they did? They flew in 10,000 cows and they started a milk farm. And now they're actually um, self-sufficient in milk and they're exporting milk. <laughs> so the point of this is that this was a chaotic uh, move to blockade Qatar, but the point of it is serious because if the US is trying to have a common front against Iran and two of its main alliance partners, including the host of to the, the Bahrain has the biggest US naval base, and Qatar has the, the air base, which we use to run the counter ISIS campaign, the Afghan war, and everything else, and they don't talk to each other. It's kind of hard to organize an effective military coalition uh, about that. All right, so I, 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 warned, um, I warned Dan this was going to happen. That th this part of the talk was supposed to go about 15 minutes, and now I've gone 45. Uh, so this always happens. So I'm going to race through the last part so we can get to the QA part. And, this, and it shouldn't take long, because I've set the structural context. One of the most important things that the Arab uprisings proved to the leaders of the Middle East is that protest is contagious. When you saw the spread of revolution from Tunisia to Egypt to the entire Middle East overnight, um, people, the, the tendency now is to downplay the Arab Spring and say, well, it didn't really change anything, didn't really matter. It's utter hogwash. It changed everything. And one of the things that it changed is that it became at least a, a commitment, a belief on the part of almost every leader in the region that a protest or an, a revolution anywhere could become a mortal threat to their own survival. Arab regimes, for the most part, only really care about one thing, and that's keeping themselves in power. And the idea that a protest or a revolution anywhere could pose a fundamental threat to their own survival became one of the core operating principles of the post-Arab Spring Middle East. Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the UAE, they intervene everywhere, not just for the fun, fun and giggles of it, because they fear that anything which goes wrong in any of these countries could diffuse back into their own countries. This existential fear that of revolution colors almost everything. So we here in the West might think the Arab Spring failed, it doesn't matter, none of these people do. They see it as a fundamental threat to be contained. And so this unification of, of political space and the notion that a threat anywhere is a threat to domestic regime security guarantees this high level of interventionism um, every place else. And it guarantees, in many ways, the continuation and the exacerbation of struggles almost everywhere. So, you know, the, if you think about what's happened over the last year, um, everybody thought the Arab Spring was over and, and that uh, things had settled down. And then Sudan <laughs> goes up in these unbelievable protests, the unbelievable ways in which the Sudanese were able to coordinate a mass mobilization. Um, and, you, and sustain it in the face of militarized attacks and everything else is just absolutely inspirational. 
and it inspired the Algerians. This is exactly what everybody was afraid of. By everybody, I mean Arab regimes. Look at that, Sudan to Algeria. You know, it's not as far as you know, Tunisia to Yemen, but it's pretty far. Um, and yet, there were clear Im imitation and demonstration effects between Sudan and Algeria. And Algeria, again, has sustained almost 30 weeks of, of weekly protests um, and has forced uh, the, the president out of office and is continuing to, to carry these out. And now we bring it all full circle. Um, tomorrow, uh, people are expecting some of the most um, uh, large and regime-threatening protests in Egypt since 2013, um, after everybody basically believed that, that um, Egypt had basically, you know, was done with protest um, after the military coup of 2013. Last week, suddenly there were protests and everybody was stunned and shocked. And now, Cairo is, uh, is basically a military garrison. Um, and is that because they really think a revolution is about to happen? They don't know. They don't know and they don't want to take the risk. My basic rule of thumb, and I have read a lot about this, is everywhere in the region, you have been seeing large scale protests, um, over, usually over economic and service issues um, in Iran, in Iraq, in Lebanon, Syria's at war, um, in Jordan, in Israel, in, in Gaza even. Um, over here, I mean, they're so rich, you can't do anything. Why, why would they protest? I mean, they're, they're rich. Um, Yemen, now Egypt, Libya at war, Algeria, Sudan. Every country in the Middle East is experiencing large-scale protest activity at one time or another. The only difference is it hasn't led to regime overthrow, and it hasn't been linked up into a single kind of thing with a catchy name. Um, I think, in the, getting back to my opening question about change, people set the bar way too high. You don't need to overthrow governments for protests to be significant. These protests are fundamentally changing the relationship between regimes and their populations, and they're fundamentally changing all kinds of relationships um, and, 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 and um, the distributions of power within those countries. And you never actually know, when you say something failed or something ended, you never actually know when it ended. So uh, yeah, again, we were talking about this before. In 2012, Egypt was coded in the famous books of the time as a success, a democratic transition success. 2013, not anymore. Now it's a coup. Now it's a failure, right? Now, then it turns into authoritarian restoration. Well, what happens if, 2000, if these protests this week suddenly spike up again? None of these regimes is stable. They all know it and they have absolutely no solutions to it. And that is the fundamental reality of the Middle East right now. Um, I could say more about it, but I promised I was going to go fast, and I really am. I just want to say a few things about um, kind of some of the uh, kind of individual level things, because they also matter here. The kids protesting in Cairo a few days ago, they did a, a, a quick survey of them, and most of the reports say that the, the median age of the protesters is between 16 and, 16 and 21. That means that when the, Arab, when the revolution happened, they were like 10 years old, right? They don't remember any of this stuff. They are not burdened with the, um, you know, the legacies of the post-Arab Spring failures. They have their own issues, their own reasons. They also have virtually no meaningful, organized political structures to contain or to guide or to shape their political engagement. I wrote many years ago, actually in the New Arab Wars, one of the things that I wrote was that when this inevitable new round of contention happens, it's going to be a lot bloodier and a lot more chaotic because the regimes have spent the last 10 years destroying civil society, destroying political parties, and basically removing all the intermediary organizations that could step up and negotiate on behalf of them. In the Sudan, the reason Sudan worked as well as it did is because the Sudanese professional associations came together, provided a cross-ideological leadership, which was able to negotiate effectively with the regime and maintain discipline, remarkable discipline um, across their things. There's nothing like that in Egypt anymore. Anybody who could have done that is in jail or dead. And so if push does begin to come to shove, you know, in 2011, they could go negotiate with leaders of political parties, representatives of the movement, and the Muslim Brotherhood. None of those exist anymore. So when it happens, it's going to be a lot worse in some cases, and a lot better in other cases. Um, and that distribution really is 
something you have to pay a lot of attention to. The last thing I'm going to mention is the refugee issue. And I'm happy to talk more about this in Q&A. But it often gets like whitewashed or forgotten other than kind of as a humanitarian sob story. Um, but the reality is that because of Syria, because of Yemen, because of Libya, there's and because of Iraq, people forget about the Iraq part. There's something in the ballpark between 10 and 20 million refugees or internally displaced uh, generations that have experienced unbelievable trauma where there's been basically no education uh, and the kids aren't, aren't, you know, they're getting rudimentary education at best. Um, because they're cursed with Syrian or Iraqi passports, uh, they can't go anywhere. They can't emigrate. Uh, so they're kind of stuck there. They're political pawns. They're completely asocialized. Uh, in terms of um, politics or kind of employment or ordinary society, 10 million of them, that's gonna matter. And people, I, I get so frustrated. I understand it, I do it myself. Say, well, Jordan is resilient. They've managed to absorb the refugees. Lebanon is resilient. They've managed to absorb the refugees. By some, by some estimates, um, up to half the population of Lebanon is now Syrian. By some estimates, uh, uh, between a third between a quarter and a third of the population of Jordan is now uh, is now Syrian. They're not counted as population because they, they're supposed to go back. They're not going back. And what is going to happen to them? Are they going to remain politically quiescent forever? Are they going to remain peaceful forever when they have no jobs, no education, no meaningful prospect for integration into society? Um, what are they going to, I don't know what they're going to become. Nobody knows what they're going to become. And what worries me is that nobody even really seems to be thinking about, uh, about it. And you know how I know that no one's really thinking about it is because you can look at one isolated case. And this is what I'm going to end with. Uh, if you look at Mosul, Mosul, uh, was liberated by the United, the U S led coalition against ISIS, the spectacularly successful campaign, which destroyed the Islamic state as a, uh, territorial caliphate. Um, and since that liberation, Mosul has gone almost entirely unreconstructed. Um, a lot of like the, the families of, of ISIS fighters are rotting in camps where they're basically being continually indoctrinated with ISIS propaganda. Many of the, of the uh, men, uh, Sunni men from the Mosul area are simply rounded up by the state and accused without any evidence or trial of being um, ISIS sympathizers and they're being summarily executed or thrown into horrific jail conditions over the long term. If people were really thinking about the long term disruptive effects of the displaced and traumatized populations of the Middle East, you would see it in a place that, that the United States just spent huge amounts of money, military material and diplomatic capital to liberate and instead they did it and walked away. And I think that that's the sort of thing that's likely to come back and haunt. Okay, I barely scratched the surface, but I talked way too long. So I'm just gonna stop. And um, then all the things that I didn't talk about, feel free to ask me about because uh, I'm always happy to give it a go. All right, so Mark, I'll let you point out to the audience members and I'll come around with the microphone. Sure, sir. I have two, one simple question and one a little bit more complicated. Simple question is, why Saudi Arabia and UAE are supporting financially the Taliban causing havoc in Afghanistan? I don't understand that. They're supposed to be our allies. They should stop doing that so that there is some kind of peace and mo moderation in Afghanistan. That's easy question. The second one is, what's the antagonism of Saudis, UAE, and other Arab states or kingdoms against Muslim Brotherhood? Against what? Oh, Muslim, Muslim Brotherhood. Brotherhood. I, I mean, they're not nonviolent for the most part, and they are maybe a little bit better educated, and maybe democratic to some extent, and they just did away with it in Egypt. So on your, your first question, which is not a simple question, um, I, I, I'm basically going to not answer it directly because of the, because of the peculiar way that uh, the American academia divides the world. Um, Afghanistan is not in the Middle East. I know. <laughs> no, I'm dead serious. Like, I, I don't know what it's like in Michigan, but at GW, we always have this problem of 
kids want to take uh, classes on Pakistan and Afghanistan, and the, uh, the Asian studies doesn't want to deal with it because they've got all of Asia to worry about. And we don't want to deal with it because we're, you know, MENA, we end in Iran. And so basically the courses end up not being taught except by terrorism experts. Um, so the, the broader answer to your question is that Saudi Arabia and the UAE and Qatar and Turkey, um, they generally, um, they find proxies where they, where, where they can find them. They tend to be undiscriminating about it. So Iran, for the most part, is able to work with uh, Shia militias and Shia groups because that's their competitive advantage. Qatar is typically, and this is part of the answer to your second question, Qatar is typically able to work through Muslim Brotherhood um, uh, type networks and to find proxies that way. Um, the UAE typically is able to find proxies and mobilize through kind of uh, business, you know, kind of the business community and, you know, kind of the, the cosmopolitan elite types. Um, and they often find their proxies there, kind of the business classes. Saudi Arabia used to find its proxies in the Islamist world, but um, they have a lot of competitors there between Turkey and Qatar. Um, they still uh, use uh, Salafi groups uh, like the Taliban as, uh, as proxies, um, which is sympathetic to ideologically to kind of pre-2015 Saudi Arabia, now is becoming a little bit dicier. But in Syria, I mean, I, I, would, I would barely be exaggerating to say that when it came time to look for proxies to fight on the ground, you know, basically the, the you know, the, um, the Qataris would go and find the local Muslim Brotherhood guy and say, here's a bunch of money, we want you to stand this up, and you get, done, done boss. And we know what the Iranians do. The Saudis would walk around with suitcases full of cash, basically saying, would anyone like to be our proxy? You, you look like a good proxy. I mean, they would go to the tribes. They would go to you know, local defense forces. They, they weren't very discriminating. They didn't have a lot of local knowledge on the ground. They had a lot of money. And so they ended up supporting a lot of groups, um, which don't really make a lot of sense ideologically. What happened in 2013-ish um, was that Syria became a really popular issue. Um, in the Gulf, and they started raising a ton of private money from like wealthy people around the Gulf, and it tended to go towards the most extreme Islamist types because conservative, you know, conservative Gulf. They like the guys with the beards. The guys with the beards are good fighters, and it was like this self-generating cycle. And so, in a sense, the money that was coming out of the Gulf uh, and uh, Kuwait became one of the main uh, kind of uh, 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 distribution points for this money and for this aid really contributed to the radicalization of the Syrian insurgency in ways that actually ended up scaring the heck out of Saudi Arabia when it suddenly, de suddenly discovered how much ideological support there was for the Islamic State and for these jihadist forces inside of Saudi Arabia. And then they kind of say, oh, what have we done? So the, 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 the anti-Muslim Brotherhood sentiment um, partly comes from the belief that the Muslim Brotherhood is aligned with Qatar. And so the, in the conflict with Qatar, um, the Muslim Brotherhood became the enemy. Um, it partly came from the ideological threat that it posed to Saudi versions of Islam and their own claims to be the leaders of Islam. It partly came in Saudi Arabia from domestic fears where there's actually a long-term Muslim Brotherhood presence, uh, which is extremely strong in oppositional networks like the Sahwa. Um, and so they were perceived as a domestic threat as well. In the UAE, it's largely personal. Uh, Mohammed bin Zayed just hates the Muslim Brothers. He, uh, his, the story is that when he was in school, in, in I think high school, middle school, something like that, he was assigned a tutor who was a Muslim brother who tried to like recruit him and it freaked him out and turned him personally against it. And so for the UAE, there's a very strong anti-Muslim Brotherhood animus. I actually think that the, the UAE is, a, is more driving the anti-Brotherhood thing than, than Saudi Arabia. Uh, yeah. So I had a question that sort of builds off of that, which is how much do you think this regional intervention is has to do with sort of an anti-democratic feeling on the behalf of Saudi Arabia and the UAE versus specifically anti-Islamism, right? So that, mm -hmm. that those are slightly different because the, the sort of two places we saw democratic transitions, Tunisia and Egypt, they differ in terms of how Tunisia is relevant to this sort of regional order, but they also differ in terms of who won those democratic transitions, mm -hmm. right? So if we see, for instance, um, following a SIPSI in Tunisia, if we see the Muslim Brotherhood win and sort of lead the democratic path forward, 
would it be reasonable to expect a um, regional er intervention in Tunisia the way we saw in Egypt? So is this really anti-democracy or is it specifically anti-Islamism? I think it and then one more thing. How does that affect cases like Sudan, especially mm -hmm. where you see a huge overlap between military and Islamism, right? In Egypt, it's really neat. The people with guns tend to be anti-Islamist, but in Sudan, it's much harder to draw that line. No, that's a, that, that's a great point. And, and in, in Sudan, it's been especially, you know, they, um, you know, the, when the protest started, it was beginning to look like Bashir couldn't be saved. You know, the, the UAE and Saudi Arabia, they did what they always do. They kind of went to the military to try and find, you know, their, their people. But it turns out that all the senior officers and all the military, they're all Islamists um, or, you know, nominal Islamists. And so that's why they end up with Amethdi um, and uh, this guy who's, you know, who, you know, anyway, he's a bad guy. Um, but he's outside of the formal structures of the military, and so he becomes a way for them to find a military proxy on the ground. On your bigger question about um, anti-democracy or anti-Islamist, I think it's both. Yeah. I, think, um, I think in general, there's a conviction that democracy is bad. I mean, that it is just bad. That it, it's, um, you know, for, from the, the Gulf perspective, they actually have had, over the last few years that you've probably seen, a, a, a aggressive defense of monarchy as a superior system. Um, and they don't, they, they never miss a chance to say, look, all the countries that are going down in flames are republics, whereas all the monarchies are fine. Now there's some endogeneity there because they put a huge amount of financial and political resources into making sure that the monarchies survive. I mean, Jordan, Morocco, Kuwait, uh, Bahrain, even Oman, um, had huge protests in 2011 and have had protests since. But um, in those cases, Saudi Arabia and the UAE go out of their way to find ways to support those regimes and, and, and the like. Um, in general, most Arab leaders are opposed to democracy because they want to stay in power. And if there's democracy, they will not be in power anymore. So they actually see democracy as an existential threat to the only thing they care about, which is themselves staying in power. Um, and so I think that um, at the elite leadership class, it is very much anti-democratic. The anti-Islamist part, um, I think, is builds on that in the sense of democracy isn't just bad, it will also produce a specific bad outcome. Um, Islamists who, you know, in, in, in one way of thinking, you know, might or might not be, you know, someone we could work with or whatever, but in the specific case, will be aligned with Qatar. So when Egypt elects uh, Mohammed al-Morsi, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, guy, as president, that is not just Islamists coming to power. That is Egypt being moved from the Saudi camp into the Qatari camp. And that is, has huge geopolitical consequences for their internal rivalries. So it's not just that they're Islamists, it's they're Islamists aligned with the enemy, Qatar and Turkey. Um, so that, that, that's a big part of it. Where you have, they, they're willing to support a democracy in those cases where they believe that democracy can be engineered in such a way as to produce acceptable results. And so, you know, everyone mentions Tunisia as a success, and it is a success, but people often forget how close it came to failing in the summer of 2013. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was extremely close. There were several well-known secular uh, figures were assassinated, uh, and there were huge crowds in the streets baying for blood. Uh, they wanted a coup, like, um, like Egypt's coup. And that they didn't get it is an interesting, that's an interesting story. Um, and it's part of the Tunisian exceptionalism. Um, I actually think that I'm not typically uh, one, you know, in favor of like the great man theory of history or that sort of thing. But I, I truly believe that if, if Rasha Ghanoushi and Al-Qaeda Sebsi uh, had died five years previously, Tunisia would not have been a success story. I think that the two of them were able to come to an agreement on power sharing and had enough weight within their own constituencies to bring their people along for the ride. And that forming of that grand coalition with Anetha agreeing to be a junior partner um, was, you know, who knows if it was good or bad long term for Tunisian democracy, but I think that's the reason why uh, it managed to, to survive in a way that Egypt didn't. Mark? Yeah, because you're right there. Well, thank you very much. There's a lot of food for thought, and um, 
I want to ask about uh, a little bit more detail on, on some things you mentioned. Uh, one is about Tunisia, <coughs> uh, partly as Tunisia and partly as a lens on where the Islamist movement is going. Mm -hmm. um, I've been at some meetings in the Gulf where people suggest that uh, Khanushi is going to be the next spiritual guardian of, uh, of the Ikhwan, of the Islamic Brotherhood. Uh, but he has recently come out and said he's moving his party away from Islam. Uh, so there's some contradictory tendencies there. Um, I don't know if there are any long-term implications uh, that would be clear enough to talk about now, <coughs> but that, that's one set of questions. <coughs> uh, two is uh, I was struck by your statement that uh, uh, Donald Trump is trying to bring the U.S. back to this uh, quasi-hegemonic -hegem uh, state. Uh, and maybe it's kind of a minor point, but I wonder if it's Trump that is organizing this and has a plan and we're seeing the fruits of what he's doing, maybe not with great thought, but at least some, uh, as opposed to it's really the Saudis and the Israelis who are leading this with some help from the Qataris, uh, not Qataris, from the Emiratis for their own purposes at the center of which is Iran. Uh, maybe it's, maybe you could just say, yeah, that's what I meant or that's what I said and that would be all. And the last one is, <coughs> Are you able to talk any more about Qatar? Uh, and what I have in mind is that alongside of what you've been describing, which I think is, is correct and important, uh, there's another dimension of, of Qatari policy. It is the American base, but it's also Education City, all these American universities there. Uh, it is also uh, some of the people they've given uh, uh, refugee status to, uh, not Qatar that way, that's Islam, but uh, Azmi Bashara or uh, Saad uh, Adin Ibrahim. Uh, so I don't know if there's more to say about that, but there's kind of a, it, it's partly maybe, don't worry about, I mean, pick whoever you think might be important somewhere and, and have all bases covered, but uh, I'm wondering if there's more to be say, said about that. Okay, so on, uh, Tun on Tunisia, uh, Rashid Ghanoushi is not going to be the next uh, Supreme Guide of the Muslim Brotherhood. I don't think the Muslim Brotherhood really exists anymore um, in the form that we, that, that we have come to understand it. Ghanoushi has moved, he, he's, he uh, now calls it a Muslim Democrat party, not an Islamist party. Um, and in fact, they've moved so far away that they've actually opened a space now for actual Islamist parties to begin to appear uh, in Tunisia, challenging uh, Anahta, which is now largely seen as, I mean, this is like what I was saying about for the implications for Tunisian democracy. Um, the fact that in the presidential election, both of the final, uh, both of the of the final candidates were populists who were basically their campaigns were railing against the elite. Uh, the, the and the elite here includes Anetta. They by ruling in conjunction with uh, with uh, Nida Tunis for the last five years, they basically abandoned their claim to being uh, kind of an oppositional or, in, or you know an oppositional Islamist force for better or for better or for worse. Um, now their candidate uh, uh, Moro finished third, so it's still possible that he'll end up in the runoff since uh, uh, since uh, Karawi is in jail and it's hard to run a presidential campaign from prison. Um, but I think it would probably be better for Tunisia if that doesn't happen. Um, I would say that uh, Ghanoushi, um and this has been true going all the way back to 2011, does not he's widely respected in Anahda, but he doesn't necessarily speak for them. His, the move towards uh, you know, declaring it to be a party of Muslim Democrats, it got through the, par the, the, the party Congress by like one vote. Um, it was like, extremely contentious, and a lot of the younger uh, Nahda members, they would like to be a lot more Islamist than they actually are. And when, uh, when uh, Ghanoushi passes from the scene, um, I think we might actually see kind of a back to the roots uh, thing in Nahda, but we'll see. Um, your second question was, oh, when I, I, I was using Trump as shorthand, uh, the Trump administration. I don't even know if Trump knows where any of these things are on the map, to be perfectly honest. Uh, but he does have his instincts, and those instincts are actually quite interesting. He doesn't want to get involved in military interventions. He's very similar to Obama in that way, and I think for the same structural reasons. He understands that wars in the Middle East are extremely expensive, they're unpopular, and if he does them, he's going, it's going to hijack the rest of his presidency, and he doesn't want that to happen. Um, and again, this is part of the structural thing that I was talking about at the very beginning. 
One of the most interesting things in, in regional politics is the way the open, the move to have kind of an open alliance between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Um, and that's been kind of a dream of, of Israel and of the United States for decades. Um, I don't think we're going to get quite there yet, especially with what's going on in, in Jerusalem and everything. But it's much, it's, it's now not even like uh, whispered. Now it's openly discussed. And I think that's actually a fairly consequential change is the taboo against having uh, uh, an alliance with Israel is badly eroded. And Qatar, I don't know, really know. I mean, I think what you, what you said captures it quite nicely. I mean, they are, it, it is a, it, you know, when you have a, um, you know, a country which is fabulously wealthy and kind of a young, you know, kind of uh, ambitious uh, emir, um, you know, you can do lots of different things. I mean, so everyone says it's Qatar and the Muslim Brotherhood, but Qatar was also one of the main sponsors of the Arab Spring activists. You know, the, because of Al Jazeera, a lot of them, the bloggers, the they all came through Doha. Doha, uh, I don't know if they still do, but uh, for years they had 365 international conferences a year. Uh, there was a major international conference every single day of the year. Um, I mean, and they were everything, they were doctors, neurology, education, whatever, uh, education city, as you said. I mean, there, so there's a lot of stuff going on with Qatar. Um, one of the things which is interesting about Qatar is that the, the blockade has actually generated some real nationalism and real national identity in Qatar, which is never really there before. And um, so that's been kind of interesting to see. But there's one thing that I, you know, I wanted to, you know, in terms of this question of change, and you're, you mentioned if Qatar um, brought this back to me. I want to sort of so I would say roughly from 1970 until 2010, if you were on the throne or in the presidential palace in 1970, in 2010, everywhere in the Middle East, you still were, or your designated successor, your son or your vice president, in the case of uh, Sadat and Mubarak. I mean, that's an enormous degree of continuity. And so you know, from 2010 until now, which countries have new leaders, have a new head of state? Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, uh, depending on how you count uh, Mohammed bin Salman, although, you know, again, maybe not Saudi Arabia quite yet. Um, uh, Yemen, uh, Oman is on the brink, and we know that uh, it's not going to pass to his son. I don't know, you know, because uh, the, uh, the Sultan doesn't have, any, uh, doesn't have any offspring. So the story is that there's an envelope uh, with his designated successor's name on it, which will be opened after his death. Um, so maybe it's true, maybe it isn't. Um, the UAE is still, um, well, the titular head of state is gone, but still, they, they haven't changed. Qatar has changed. Uh, the emir stepped down in 2013, and his son replaced him. Um, Kuwait uh, is, still has the same leader, but not probably for long, because he's, uh, he's quite ill. Um, Iraq has a new president. Uh, uh, Jordan still hanging on. Um, Israel will find out um, uh, eventually um, after Netanyahu lost the election. Um, Mahmoud Abbas is eternal. Um, and apparently, no, nothing will get him out. But um, uh, Lebanon and then Syria, Syria and Bahrain still have the same leaders. Um, but it's actually fascinating to think about. It. This is something like 75% of the countries in the Middle East have new leaders since 2010, after going four decades with no real change in leadership. And I think that because people don't include things like uh, like the Emir of Qatar stepping down, um, they kind of or the succession from a King Abdullah to King Salman in Saudi Arabia, which actually was hugely. I, I actually think that the the internal transformations that Mohammed bin Salman has brought about inside Saudi Arabia come close to constituting a regime change um, in terms of the way power is now organized in Saudi Arabia compared to the way it has been in previous decades. We'll have to wait and see on that. But just in, I, I think it's sometimes useful for people to take a step back and realize the magnitude of how much has really changed, even at kind of the formal political level. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry that I missed most of your talk. So my question will. I already answered about it. the last part. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I missed the talk. I had another commitment. But um, in the last part of the talk, uh, you, you mentioned uh, a topic which is really, I think, um, which is really not picked up pace in terms of how people approach it. So in terms of understanding the Middle East, as most of the questions are, they want to know more about the leaders and the political situation. But you, you touched upon this very important point, which is population displacement and population movements. How do we understand this? Mm -hmm. And obviously, 
at this point, we don't really know what the, what the outcomes will be. It's very recent. But I also want you to uh, highlight one interesting point, an observation I want to share from my own city. My own city hosts 3 million Syrians, so which is quite interesting. But the picture I want to paint uh, is quite uh, different than uh, what people tend to think in terms of refugees probably uh, somewhere on the street uh, uh, without anything almost. Syrians have adapted quite extremely well is at least in the Istanbul case. Yeah. Three million, they work, obviously sm illegally, but they work, they own a house. So my, my question is at <coughs> two levels. Um, level one is what explains this diverse outcome? So what is the opposite of Turkey in this case? Is it Lebanon? Is it uh, Jordan? That's one thing. And number two, this is more on the sociological societal mm -hmm. level impact. But uh, on the other side, I want to hear your ideas in terms of what might be the long-term political uh, pro uh, outcomes of the uh, refugee crisis might have on these uh, states. Yeah, for sure. I, I think that one of the one of the big differences between the outcomes in Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan is simply scale. I mean, so you can have three million uh, Syrians in Turkey out of a population of what, eighty million? Yeah, but 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 even if it's even if it's like six six million out of eighty million. Million Syrian children born in Turkey. Yeah, it's amazing, and then whereas down here you're talking about uh, you know two million Syrians with a population of seven million, million and a half, two million Syrians with a population of four million. So I think that the scale and the scope is very different. That said, as you know very well, you know in you know the the southern provinces of Turkey, some of them were like majority Arab by 2012, 2013. And so now uh, what, what uh, Erdogan's trying to do is carving out this like safe area, so-called safe area over the border back into Syria and push these people back down into Syria, basically into a holding pen um, uh, across the Syrian border, which will be extremely disruptive and will, and will undo a lot of the adaptation um, and integration and I think that you see a real rise in anti-Syrian racism um, and kind of xenophobia in, in both Turkey and Lebanon, not so much in Jordan. Um, Jordan's the outlier there, but in Lebanon, I was just in Lebanon last week, and uh, the, the, the pressures that they are putting on Syrians there are just unbelievable. They're trying to force them to go back, even though it's radically unsafe for them to do so. Um, and then, uh, you know, and then, Everybody is like trying to figure out what to do with Idlib because on the one hand, it's a humanitarian nightmare uh, if there's any kind of war there because you've got you know, three, four million civilians who are basically trapped. They can't go anywhere and a war is gonna have devastating effects. At the same time, the Idlib is totally controlled by Al Qaeda in Syria by, I mean, they can, HTS can say all they want that they're not Al Qaeda. We all know that they are. Um, and it's, you know, okay, so what exactly do you do if it's the case that HTS and Al Qaeda is like setting up essentially a safe haven here, um, but we have to protect it, um, it becomes extremely dicey. Um, I think that the, the question I thought you were going to ask that a lot of people ask is about the borders and, you know, kind of what happens there. And it's really interesting. Back in 2014, 2015, I think everybody was kind of converging on this notion that the Westphalia borders uh, or you know the or the uh, the the San Remo borders um, were about Sykes Pico whatever you want to call it were about to be withdrawn because you had ISIS basically was controlling this entire area for you know you know a third of Syria a third of Iraq erased the border between them and meanwhile the Kurds were about to declare independence up there in the KR up in the KRG and you, meanwhile the U.S. is arming and supporting uh, the, the, the SDF which is essentially the, the YPG which is basically the Kurds, the PKK, um, all through here so you could so there's the idea that you'd end up some kind of like Kurdish uh, super state here, uh, Sunni ISIS state here, a rump Shia, you know what used to be Iraq, you know, you know Assadistan up here in Syria and there's this idea that you were going to end up with this complete redrawing of the borders. And in fact, none of it has happened. None of the borders have been withdrawn, have, have been redrawn. They've all, they've all basically, the Kurdish referendum led to the immediate reassertion of Iraqi sovereignty and there's a political disaster for the Kurds. Um, 
the uh, ISIS was obviously defeated as a territorial concept, and the Sunni areas were restored to Iraqi sovereignty. Syria continues to be kind of semi-sovereign in all kinds of weird ways, but the borders haven't been withdrawn. They're talking about federalism. This new constitutional committee is talking about decentralization and everything, but they're not talking about partition. And you know, meanwhile, Erdogan is looking at all this and saying, you guys can do whatever you want in eastern Syria as long as it's not run by the Kurds. Oh, well, it actually is run by the Kurds. Um, and the US is like kind of caught in the middle of that and there's no easy answer to it. But the borders have proven amazingly resilient um, in a way that the, the, peop the movement of peoples has not in terms of the restoration or the repatriation of people back to their original homes. And people forget that this falls in the wake of the Iraq war and then the Iraqi civil war, which led, which sent like five, six million Iraqis out in there. And a lot of them did end up returning, but most of them did not return to their original homes because they've been, you know, ethnic cleansing, sectarian cleansing. And so you get like a lot of secondary displacement and, you know, so. Well, after all, all the borders in the Middle East were drawn by sites and people. And yet, they, and yet they're remarkably resilient. They, they survive. <laughs> Nonetheless, they took a pen and a ruler. They, they but you know where it's changed, where it could change, though, is if Turkey actually succeeds in drawing up this uh, safe zone, the border is actually that might actually move. Um, I don't know how long this would have to become uh, governed and policed by Turkish troops for it to finally be annexed to uh, to Turkey. Um, but, you know, that's kind of the direction that that seems to be going. But you mean the Idlib province? Not, 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 not Idlib, but the safe area along, um, along the north. Mm -hmm. Time for one last okay. question. You're not going to give it to Dan? No, 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 He's paying for the whole no, thing. No, no, no. Okay, so uh, I want to push you a little bit on the central thesis of the argument. So you start by saying I that. Have a thesis? Do you have a thesis? We'll find <laughs> out. Um, you start by saying that what ha there's big structural changes underfoot with relationship to U.S. power. So you say that the U.S. is no longer this unipole, and that has implications for how it can act in the region. But then you like pretty quickly qualify that claim. So you say that the U.S. is still in a dominant position in the Middle East. It's just not the only power there. You mention Russia, but then you say that Russia is not really a long-term U.S. competitor. And sure, China is involved economically, but beyond protecting oil shipments, it's not really doing much militarily. So the, the, the kind of general question is, what is actually structurally changing? Is it U.S. power or is it U.S. resolve? And if it's the latter, I think that's an important distinction for a couple reasons. Mm -hmm. The first is that these kinds of like people perceive U.S. retrenchment and that leads to these policy shifts in the region, but that's not justified by any material changes in the underlying conditions of U.S. power. And I think that IR theory would not predict that. And so that's like an interesting kind of thing that's happening in the world. Uh, and then the second is, earlier today you mentioned that uh, people in D.C. think that once Trump leaves that the U.S. can just snap back to its former self and start reasserting kind of its, its old position. And you disagree with that in, in, in no small part because Trump is already trying to reassert this old order and it's not working. But I want to hear more about what structurally prevents that from happening because it seems to me that the kind of fundamental nature of U.S. power is exactly the same as it was five years ago. We've just decided we don't want to pay for it. And those are different things. No, that's an excellent question. And I think uh, that helps me to, I, I didn't phrase this as clearly as, as, I, as I should have. Um, I think that this is, a, this is a global story, not just a, a Middle Eastern story. US power, material power, is declining. But it's not necessarily being replaced by anyone else. It's the ability of any great power to, uh, to lead or to control events in the Middle East or anywhere has simply declined. Uh, we're moving towards more of a nonpolar situation than a multipolar situation. Um, and I think that um, it's not simply a question of resolve. The U.S. is not capable of policing Iraq, of, of policing Syria. Um, it can try. Um, and in, in 2003, it tried. And the result was a massive drain on the Treasury and uh, the collapse of its position in all kinds of ways, both globally and regionally. 
And so I think the, the, the idea that it's simply a question of will, I think, I think is, I, mean, I understand where you're coming from with the question, but I think it's wrong. I think that our economic domination is much less, our, our, you know, our, our economic position is much weaker than it once was, both our own domestic finances, but also our role in international financial institutions and in global flows. Um, I, I think our military is far more, uh, far, far less dominant than it was. Um, I think that our political place um, is much weaker than it was. And I think Trump has accelerated that last part the most by kind of the assault on alliances. And, you know, at least um, pre Trump, you still had the transatlantic alliance and you could still see, like, you know, again, I actually think that the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear agreement, whether you support it or, or oppose it, it was a tremendous display of multilateral diplomacy and of American leadership. It, whether, you know, a lot of people don't like where it led, but it was a tremendous display of leadership. Um, in a multilateral way, um, and but again, that's no longer, and I don't think we're going to go back to that. I don't think you can rebuild those kinds of alliances overnight after they've been shattered to the extent that they have. So what does it mean is I think you end up seeing um, a far less system dominant and a far more kind of regionally, you know, the leash is a lot looser. Such as, such as it is. I think that that's why you see things like Saudi Arabia going rogue, uh, you know, and, and like doing all these things that are manifestly contrary to U.S. interests, like the blockade of Qatar, the, the killing Khashoggi, the, uh, the, the Yemen, the ongoing Yemen campaign. These are all things that the U.S. very much wanted it to stop doing, but it doesn't feel the need to listen to the U.S. in the way that it did you know, 10 years ago or 20 years ago. So, I, so, so I, I guess that's the best way I can answer the question is that to me, it's very clear that the US power is radically diminished. And it's a structural thing, not simply, a, you know, bad policies or, or willpower. But that my point about China and Russia was to say that no, this isn't like, you know, the power transitions of yore. It's not like China is waiting for its moment to launch a power grab and structure the Middle East as a, as a Chinese imperium. It's not the way it's working either. They have their interests and they're gonna try and protect them. And I do think that as their confidence in the US ability to police the Gulf uh, diminishes correctly, um, I think they will be more assertive in protecting those energy flows, but not in a way of like trying to kick the US out of the Gulf. I don't think it's like that anymore. I think it's less power overall for the outside and more kind of autonomous action on the part of allies or, or of, of states in the region. And they have their own priorities and that's a totally normal thing. It's just that during the 20 years of US Imperium, um, those, their own interests were often subordinated um, to the American rules. Um, and again, that seems like a crude way to state it, but I mean, there was all kinds of intra-alliance politics and friction and trouble, especially after 9-11. But the reality of it was that the U.S. had this regional order and they mostly wanted to stay within it. And now states can kind of you know, pick and choose when they want to stay in it, which is just, a, to me, that really is a structural change. Well, that covered an incredible terrain, <laughs> literally, figuratively, theoretically, empirically. So thank you so much, Mark. Thank you. And, uh,